John Locke, 1632-1704, from The Reasonableness of Christianity. Trained as a physician, Locke became the most important empiricist philosopher of his time, the philosophical defender of Newtonian physics and moderate political liberalism. In The Reasonableness of Christianity, published in 1699, he claimed to set out a reasonable Christianity based solely on the attentive and unbiased reading of the Bible. It is obvious to anyone who reads the New Testament that the doctrine of redemption and consequently of the gospel is founded upon the supposition of Adam's fall. To understand, therefore, what we are res restored to by Jesus Christ, we must consider what the scriptures show we lost by Adam. This I thought worthy of a diligent and unbiased search, since I found the two extremes that men run into this, run into on this point, either on the one hand shook the foundations of all religion, or on the other made Christianity almost nothing. For while men would have all Adam's posterity doomed to eternal infinite punishment for the transgression of Adam, whose millions had never heard of, and no one had authorized to transact for him, or to be his representative, this seemed to others so little consistent with the justice or goodness of the great and infinite God, that they thought there was no redemption necessary, and consequently, there was none rather than admit of it upon a supposition so derogatory to the honor and attributes of that infinite being. So we made Jesus Christ nothing but the restorer and preacher of pure natural religion, thereby doing violence to the whole tenor of the New Testament. And indeed, both sides will be suspected to have trespassed this way against the written word of God by anyone who does not take it to be a collection of writings designed by God for the instruction of the illiterate bulk of mankind in the way of salvation and therefore generally and in necessary points to be understood in the plain direct meaning of the words and phrases such as they may be supposed to have had in the mouths of the speakers who used them according to the language of that time and country wherein they lived, without such learned, artificial, and forced senses of them, as are sought out, and put upon them in the most of the systems of divinity, according to the notions that each one has been bred up in. To one that, thus unbiased, reads the scriptures, what Adam fell from is invisible, was the state of perfect obedience which is called justice in the New Testament, through the word, which in the original signifies justice, be translated righteousness. And by this fall he lost paradise, wherein was tranquility and the tree of life. He lost bliss and immortality. If any of the posterity of Adam were just, they shall not lose the reward of it, eternal life and bliss, by being his mortal issue. Christ will bring them all to life again, and then they shall be put every one upon his own trial and receive judgment as he is found to be righteous or not. And the righteous, as our Savior says in Matthew twenty five forty six, shall go into eternal life. But yet all having sinned, Romans three twenty three, and come short of the glory of God, i.e. the kingdom of God in heaven, which is often called his glory, both Jews and Gentiles, verse 22, so that by the deeds of the law no one could be justified, verse 20, it follows that no one could have an eternal life and bliss. This then being the case, that whoever is guilty of any sin should certainly die and cease to be, the benefit of life restored by Christ at the resurrection would have been no great advantage, for as much as, here again, death must have seized upon all mankind, because all had sinned, for the wages of sin everywhere, death, as well after, as before the resurrection. If God had not found out a way to justify some, so many as obeyed another law which God gave, which in the New Testament is called the law of faith, Romans 3.27, and is opposed to the law of works. The difference between the law of works and the law of faith is only this, that the law of works makes no allowance for failing on any occasion. Those that, are, that obey are righteous, those that are any part disobey are unrighteous, and must not expect life, the reward of righteousness but by the law of faith, faith is allowed to supply the def defect of full obedience so that the believers are admitted to life and immortality as if they were righteous. What are we now required to believe to attain eternal life is plainly set down in the gospel. St. Jude tells us, John 3, 36, that he believed on the Son hath life, 
and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. What is believing on him is, we are also told in the next chapter, the woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. The woman then went into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man that hath told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Messiah? And many of the Samaritans believed on him for the saying of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, many more believed because of his words, and said to the woman, We believe not any longer because of thy saying, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this man is truly the Savior of the world, the Messiah. John 4:25 through 26, 28 through 29, 39 through 42. By which place it is plain that believing on the Son is the believing that Jesus was the Messiah, giving credit to the miracles he did, and the profession he made of himself. For those who were said to believe on him, for the saying of the woman, verse 39, tell the woman that they now believed, not any longer because of her saying, but that having heard him themselves, they knew, i.e. believed, past doubt that he was the Messiah. To convince men of this, he did his miracles, and their assent to or not assenting to this made them to be or not to be of his church, believers or not believers. It is not enough to believe him to be the Messiah, the Lord, without obeying him. This part of the new covenant, the apostle also in the preaching the gospel of the Messiah, were nearly joined with the doctrine of faith. The first place where we find our Savior to have mentioned the day of judgment is John 5:28 and 29. In these words, the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his, i.e., the Son of God's, voice, and shall come forth, that they have done good unto the resurrection of life, and that they have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That which puts the distinction, if we will believe our Savior, is having done good or evil. It is remarkable that everywhere the sentence follows, doing or not doing, without any mention of believing or not believing. Not that any to whom the gospel hath been preached shall be saved without believing Jesus to be the Messiah, for all being sinners and transgressors of the law, and so unjust, all liable to condemnation, unless they believe, and so through grace are justified by God for this faith, which shall be accounted to them for righteousness, but the rest wanting this cover, this allowance for their transgressions, must answer for their actions, and being found transgressors of the law, shall by the letter and sanction of that law be condemned for not having been paid full obedience to that law, and not for want of faith, that is not the guilt in which the punishment is laid, though it be the want of faith which lays open their guilt uncovered and exposes them to the sentence of the law against all that are unrighteous. The common objection here is that if all sinners shall be condemned, but such as have a gracious allowance made them, and so are justified by God for believing Jesus to be the Messiah, and so taking them for their king, whom they are resolved to obey to the utmost of their power, what shall become of all mankind who lived before our Savior's time, who never heard of this name and consequently could not believe in him? To this the answer is so obvious and natural that one would wonder how any reasonable man should think it worth the urging. Nobody was or can be required to believe what was never proposed to him to believe. All then that was required before his appearing in the world was to believe what God had revealed and to reply with a full assurance in God for the performance of his promise and to believe that in due time he would send them the Messiah, this anointed king, this promised Savior and Deliverer, according to his word. There is another difficulty often to be met with, which seems to have something of more weight in it, that is, that though the faith of those before Christ, believing that God would send the Messiah to be Prince and Savior to his people as he had promised, and the faith of those since his time, believing Jesus to be that Messiah promised and sent by God, shall be accounted to them for righteousness, yet what shall become of all the rest of mankind, who never having never heard of the promise or news of a Savior, not a word of a Messiah to be sent, and that was come, have no have had no thought or belief concerning him. To this I answer that God will require of every man according to what a man hath, and not according to what he hath not. Though they were many, or being strangers to the commonwealth of Israel, were also strangers to the oracles of God committed to that people, many to whom the promise of the Messiah never came, and so were never in a capacity to believe or reject that revelation. Yet God had, by the light of reason, revealed to all the same spark of the divine nature and knowledge in man, 
which making him a man showed him the law he was under as a man, showed him also the way of atoning the merciful, kind, and compassionate author and father of him, and his being, when he had transgressed that law, that he that made use of his candle of the Lord, so far as to find what was his duty, could not miss to find also the way to reconciliation and forgiveness when he had failed of his duty. Though if he used not his reason this way, if he put out or neglected this light, he might, perhaps, see neither. From the works of John Locke.